There's a story in the Bible about God providing manna from heaven, food to sustain the Israelites while they were wandering in the wilderness. But it never said specifically what it was. What was this manna from heaven? When I asked that question, I had no idea how much my life was about to change. The first miracle that Jesus was reported to have done was turning water into wine at a wedding. The story goes that they ran out of wine and Jesus put a portion of the manna into the water that they boiled as tea. He told the waiters to pass it out as wine. So I call up Deepak and I said, Deepak, I got to talk to you. I go, I just found some stuff in the Bible that's not making any sense. I think I found some psychedelics in there. I think there's meditation. Like, what do you think? And he's quiet on the phone. And I was like, Deepak, are you there? And he's like, yeah. He said, uh, where'd, you, where'd you find this exactly? Like, send me what you're talking to me about. What do you want to do, Deepak? What should we do about this? You want to write something up? And Deepak was like, this is too important. He's like, why don't we have a conversation about this? Could part of the religious experience have to do with plant sacraments? In Deepak's tradition, the mystery plant Soma was used to bring people to communion with God. Could have been that the hymns of the Rig Veda were actually sung to this plant which had no seeds, that uh, had no flowers, that was really mushrooms. There's a scene in the movie Noah starring Russell Crowe where he has a dream that he's underwater with animals floating past. He wakes up knowing that God wants him to do something, but he doesn't know what. He goes and sits with the wise man in the cave, played by Anthony Hopkins, who gives him some psychedelic tea. He drinks it and has a detailed vision of exactly what God wants him to do. First of all, that's a possibility. Yep. Secondly, why does our brain have receptors to these things? Well, because we are part of the same nature. You know, we're not separate from nature. Science is based on a subject-object split, on a separation that is artificial. Me and the universe, when in fact I'm also part of the universe. Why? So the same electrical storms that create thunder and lightning in the sky create synaptic firings in my brain, which creates thought. Mm -hmm. We are part of a wholeness. And what the religious experience is to experience that wholeness. What is enlightenment but being one with the source? So whilst they gave people what I wouldn't even call altered state of consciousness, I wouldn't call them hallucinations. They help people break out of the everyday hallucination of separation and to the reality of truth. And whether they did it through wine or mana or soma, who cares? It doesn't even make any sense. How could these ancient plants that connect you to God be somehow taken out? Could these plants be the ancient wisdom that we need for our modern problems? What we call today everyday reality, which we take for normal, okay? Mm -hmm. There's war, there's terrorism, there's global warming. There's social injustice. 50% of the world lives on less than $2 a day. The environment is totally screwed up. And we say this is normal. Yeah. It's psychotic, mm -hmm. right? And it's psychotic because we have created it. What do you think it would take to break through that boundary at this point? I mean, here we are in this 21st Let's century. Let's have a party. We'll bring everybody down to Peru and, and enlighten yeah, them. Yeah, and put some in the pot and let's drink it. Amen. Amen. Did Deepak Chopra just tell me to go down to Peru and drink ayahuasca tea, one of the most powerful psychedelics known to man? Still dazed by what Deepak had recommended, I bumped into our friend Jerry, who had generously loaned us his beach house for the interview. I was curious what he thought about what Deepak said. I didn't realize at the time, but Jerry's world was spinning out of control. 
Despite having sold his company for almost $100 million, Jerry was abusing drugs, drinking a lot of alcohol, his family was in shambles, and he was basically trying to kill himself slowly. More than I realized, Deepak's words were really sinking in. At this point, you might be wondering who this zappy guy is. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'd done everything society told me to do. Go to school, get a job, make a bunch of money, fall in love, start a family. I was living the American dream. I bought Beer.com for $80,000. A few months later, I sold it for $7 million. Here I am starring in my own Super Bowl ad. Life was becoming very surreal. Even though I had it all, my conversation with Deepak made it clear that there were other experiences that I needed to have. The value that I place on the experience is more important to me. So I always felt like I'd rather have a passport full of stamps than a house of a certain type. It occurred to me that like most people, I'd been searching for happiness outside of myself. And I was having the realization that I might never be truly happy unless I went inside my own mind to look for some answers. Albert Einstein famously said, you can't fix a problem with the same consciousness or thinking that got you into the situation. What this meant to me was that if I wanted to solve a problem in my life, or if we as a society wanted to solve some of the big problems we have, like violence, eco-destruction, addiction, depression, we needed to change our collective consciousness. Could society use some of these ancient techniques for its modern problems? I was inspired by people who came before me that seemingly had it all, but chose to take the risk of going inside their own minds. These people were what I would call psychonauts, sailors of the mind. And I saw that these people were going inside their minds and exploring inside their minds as part of what they wound up doing. And I thought, wow, I have to do that. I figured before I got too extreme and sat with a shaman, I should go out and talk to some of Deepak's friends about our so-called reality. If you only identify with the realm of three dimensions, if you only identify with the realm of the body, if you only identify with the mortal circumstance and the mortal experience, then to that extent, you are at the effect of those circumstances. Faith is standing on the conviction, standing on the knowledge and the conviction. There's something way bigger going on here. What we see is only a small portion of the total reality. See, we have three states, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. But beyond that, there is a state where it's neither of these three, but there is a restful alertness that dawns deep within. There's nowhere where we escape from being energy, so we're always energy. What we see as it looks physical material is actually the reflection of light, photons of light that hit our energy and bounce back. So we're reflecting light, but we're reflecting it as a force field, a tornado of energy. If we can stand within the unreal world, the ultimate unreal, that appears real, that seems limited by the laws of time and space, and yet have faith in the realm beyond that literally invokes that realm into being. It seemed like what everyone was saying is reality is just a concept. I needed to have the direct experience of going inside. Could ancient wisdom have included plants and meditation? I was excited to learn that a lot of celebrities, people like Jerry Seinfeld, Martin Scorsese were doing this meditation for a long time. And recently, people like Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Oz and Katy Perry had taken up the meditation and it seemed to be making them even more creative. 
I wanted to see if some of this ancient wisdom could help me to tap into my creativity. In the 1960s, a funny little man named Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came out of the Himalayas to the United States and he wound up teaching his transcendental meditation technique to the Beatles, and the rest is history. Today, there are more than seven million people worldwide doing transcendental meditation. What I like about the TM technique is that there's no dogma attached to it. It's really just a simple technique of silently repeating a mantra to yourself, which causes you to transcend into your quieted mind to subtler and subtler states of consciousness until a point that you reach a place called universal consciousness, an endless field of energy that connects all of us, where all knowledge is contained and where everything is manifested from. When the Maharishi passed away in 2007, he put John Hagelin in charge. As a quantum physicist and a meditator, he had successfully used quantum theory to support Maharishi's model of creative intelligence being at the center of all creation. Waking consciousness is all about being aware of something, this, that, this concept, that person. Mm -hmm. Transcending is leaving all of that behind to isolate and experience the self itself. It's blissful. It's not the end of the story. 10, 20 minutes of that is enough. The idea is to come back into activity and increasingly integrate and stabilize the experience of inner reality, inner silence, along with outer reality. And that's when life really gets to be interesting and fun. The mind has two aspects to it. It's the brain, this which is very concrete, you can measure it, you can touch it, but it's interacting with this field of consciousness. And what they come together is our individual self, our individual personality. And that's what most people think they are. I'm five foot eleven, I have this education, I'm this part in society, I have this amount of money. But it's not fundamentally who you are. And to know that, you need to have the experience of that. And that's where meditation experience comes in. was found, that square root of one percent in some cities, here and there and there, and it does create positivity in the atmosphere, in the tendencies of the people. What excited me about this was that if we wanted to change global consciousness, we only needed a critical mass of people tapped in. When I found in the Bible verses that said, be still and know that I'm God, the kingdom of heaven is within. That's what the meditators are saying. It's so obvious, it's right there. The, the Bible is saying, meditate. These days, religious affiliation is shrinking. I needed to go speak to some of the religious leaders and top scholars of our time about whether meditation was once part of religion. When it comes to religious leaders, there's no one more high profile than Joel Osteen. I wanted to ask Joel what he thought the mana from heaven was. I've always thought that it was like bread, you know, like a mushroom or something. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. Yeah. I'd, I'd like it if it was a mushroom. It could sustain them and... Yeah. Wow. I did not expect that. Bible descriptions from Moses and Jesus sound more like mushrooms than bread. In fact, every other miracle that Jesus is reported to have done was after they drank the mushroom tea. St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, right. Italy. Here's all the disciples, here's Jesus, and giant oh, mushrooms yeah, behind cool. him. Oh, very cool, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> got Jesus over here with these giant mushrooms behind him, ain't it? Jesus with the giant mushrooms behind him. <laughs> uh, 
I wanted to talk to some people who've been there, done that. I probably had as much psychedelics as anyone alive. When you fall away for a minute, something happens. That's actually the beginning. And now you have to relearn the world just like you were a baby. What I found uh, makes ayahuasca very special, number one, is it's the only mind-altering substance that needs more than one substance. And the other fact that's interesting is that both of these substances, the MAO, which is harmalin or tetrahydrohamalo, or the DMT, both of these substances are produced in every mammalian nervous system. So there are substances that our body produces. Filmmaker Foster Gamble's documentary Thrive shattered many of the myths that we've been presented by regular society that keep us slaves to our so-called reality. So it seems to be a natural inclination to alter our consciousness somewhat. And I think one of the reasons for that is when we alter our consciousness, we can see our daily consciousness in a new way. And it shifts, tends to raise and expand our daily consciousness. And to me, that's the point. And if we can use substances, whether it's broccoli or ayahuasca or, uh, you know, C-sharp major, <laughs> to give us a glimpse of what's possible for human beings and specifically, what's next for me? What am I ready for? When my consciousness separated from my body, it changed the paradigm entirely. I realized aha, there's something more than this meat vehicle that we have. And that one realization set me off writing all night furiously <laughs> until the dawn, and it just reevaluated my whole philosophy. And from that point on, I've been on a journey of experiential spirituality, finding the answers myself, and the plants have been the greatest teachers in that quest. Many times there's a huge benefit with one experience because it really gets to the core of what's been happening. So it's almost like you know, 10 years of, of therapy in seven hours. Kundalini yoga icon Gurmukh teaches many celebrities how to journey inside using the Kundalini technique. She had her own experience with mind-altering energies. I do not regret anything I've ever done. You know, people say, I did drugs. I said, well, so what? It got you here. Forget it. I've met other people that I wish they had because I feel they can't go through the barrier. They can't go into that sixth dimension. However you want to look at it, it's going to be the unknown. And you have a choice, fear or faith. You know, faith that you're going to come out all right, that the lessons are going to be valuable, and that the medicine will guide you. Or fear, fear that something else is going to happen. It's going to be the unknown either way, so might as well choose faith. There are times in life where through different means, and God works in mysterious ways, we're shown the mountaintop. It's like through grace. It's like the hand of God lifts us up and just shows us the mountain. I owe um, a definite debt of gratitude to uh, my experience with various substances. I can't endorse it unless you're at a certain yeah. space in a certain environment with certain true healers because it can run havoc, just like LSD did. They are powerful transformational tools and have to be respected and if you approach them with enough humility and respect I tend to believe you'll be fine with them. People are afraid that when they go down there and do these medicines they're gonna lose the things that they love the most about themselves and that's just this common fear you know you get someone who loves their career and like what if I go down and I tells me I want to be a yoga instructor I'm like it's not gonna do that man and if it does you're gonna be even happier about the fact that it did. There's an opportunity to use psychotropic drugs which will open up that mind and show you my god who you really are. I'm fascinated by it uh, I'm interested in it I, I believe it will have real utility somewhere I just, it's too soon for me as a, somebody that's trained to, you know, a certain way, <laughs> do no harm, help, you know, really, really be clear about what you're doing. We're not clear yet. Whatever it takes, whether you do the drug or whether you do the, the meditation exercises or whatever way, I don't really care. There, there's no doubt in my mind that the first indication, the first formal use for hallucinogens will be at end of life. Because it's clear what I'm reading and seeing in the research is that it, it improves our ability to, to be connected with something and feel okay about the dying process. And God knows we need help with that in this country. The traditional 
psychological model or the traditional medical model, it usually takes years and years and years of therapy and years of intervention and working with a team of experts to get even just a little progress in someone's life. What I've seen in the, the analogy I give is it's 10 to 20 years of psychotherapy, often in one to two plant medicine sessions. There is a relationship to plant medicine when it is entered through the door of the traditions that brings people more to a sacred recognition of their life, their path. I think the word drug is really, has a lot of negative connotations. I can't think of, you know, maybe, if some, if some drug actually cures someone, it's medicine. See, I, I haven't heard of people going off the rails. I've seen people go off the rails. Before I took the final leap, I needed to hear it from a psychedelic badass. That person is Ram Dass. His real name was Richard Alpert, born to an affluent New England family. He attended Harvard and after graduation began as a researcher at the university. It was the 1960s and LSD had just been discovered. The government was studying its effect on individuals and enemy combatants. While a researcher at Harvard, Alpert and Professor Timothy Leary started to run experiments on students with psilocybin mushrooms and LSD, both of which were legal at the time. The results were nothing short of miraculous. Users were reporting that they were having life-changing experiences, including a study that showed that 60% of alcoholics that were given one dose of psilocybin mushrooms in the right set and setting were never alcoholics again. How could everybody not know about this? Discouraged with the West, he headed to India. His guru named him Ram Das. And when he came back to the United States and published his book, Be Here Now, he was followed around by massive groups of young people. If anybody has the right intent to want to go to their own spiritual uh, insides, the psychedelics are wonderful for them. Wonderful. Would you recommend that somebody yes. looking? Yes. So seekers should go find a shaman. Sure. And go down and. Sure. That was it. I was going to gather up a group of friends who wanted to take the risk and go as deep into our minds as humanly possible. Things are just seem to be falling in place, you know. Uh, it feels like it's guided. It feels like it's meant to be. So for me, I'm just letting it go. You know, I just assume every miracle that is going to happen is about to happen, and I should just kind of enjoy it and uh, let it happen. I have chosen to work with the mesa, which is medicine bundle, meditations, rituals, um, counseling and working with ancestral medicines such as Huachuma or San Pedro, which are ancestral medicines that have been used for over 5,000 years in the Andes of Peru uh, by pre-Incan cultures who were masters of accessing dimensions of consciousness that are so deep that we often don't access. You know, I feel like it doesn't matter where in the world you go, it's like you'll always find, you know, your kind. And um, when it comes to spirituality, I, 
I respect anything that, or anyone who kind of walks respecting the planet, loving nature and opening their heart to, you know, the universe and love itself. As long as that's the main priority behind your religion or your, you know, ceremonial spiritual belief, then, you know, I'm down with you. I've got a few intents. Some are very personal, which I'm going to try and bring back to my family and loved ones. Um, and try and take some of that knowledge or the glimpse of the other dimensions that are out there, which I've been trying to do kind of in artificial ways. I mean, sometimes with my own artwork and my creativity, but in other ways with less natural things. And sometimes that's an anaesthetic for pain or just your day-to-day -day life that gets you down. But, um, yeah, this is something that's been calling me for a while to come and do this. But it hasn't been the right moment in my life. And so it all seemed to just fall into place naturally. I'm here to have sort of like a rebirth. Um, to, you know, tap into a, a place that I've, I guess I've never gone. So... I don't know where that is, I don't know what that is, but hopefully it's, it's a good thing and, and, I'll, and I'll be able to get through it. When you drink the medicine, 50% of the medicine's responsibility is to do all the healing, all the cleansing, all the awakening, all the clearing, all the harmonizing that it needs to do. But the other 50% of taking it further, of taking it deeper, is always yours. Part of my, my uh, work in this is to make the most gentle transition possible from being very sleepy to being fully awake. <laughs> really looking forward to tapping into some of those guys stuff upstairs. San Pedro trip was, was gnarly. Um, it was really insane because Freddy Puma, you know, the, the shaman that introduced us to the, to the catalyst to a spiritual journey, um, you know, which was the San Pedro, the drink. He, uh, so in tune, that guy. And I recall, you know, being at the, at the, at the top of the mountain you know, at this plateau where we all, you know, we're just so tired from this massive, you know, high altitude trek. And we're finally, you know, getting some air. And you're, you're looking off at these amazing clouds that are flying right at you. And you're at the precipice of this mountaintop. And, you know, you see hundreds of feet below you. And I got this enormous sorrow that I, I was just overwhelmed with. And the sorrow that consumed me was something that I've been carrying for many years, kind of like a, like a little rebellious anger, like, why am I here? Like, you know, like, dad, you know, like I didn't knock on your balls, you know, to come out into this, you know, universe kind of anger that, I, that, that I've been holding since I was a teenager, you know what I mean? Why stay in the cows? <laughs> Why suffer? Why struggle? When you can liberate all of that and be of higher service while being gentle on yourself. I know that you need your ups and downs so that you can be human and enjoy life um, and transition because it's part of the beauty of existence is to be sad and enjoy happiness. You need to know both sides. But this overwhelming sadness wasn't mine. It didn't belong to me. Ever since I was a little kid, it didn't belong to me. It's not mine. I'm a passenger, like Iggy Pop says, you know what I mean? I'm here to ride this, you know, and, and, and in a respectful way, respect every, every, everything that I come across and, you know, walk my path with love and, you know, say goodbye after my journey's done. And he came out and he just, I felt this warm energy behind me. And there he was while I was on the rock overlooking the, the, the clouds that are flying towards me. I was just crying, you know? And he touched my shoulder and he said, it's not yours. Let it go.
if my trip ended today, I've had, you know, 20 years of heavy pain lifted off of my shoulders, and I'd be a happy camper without doing the ayahuasca. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling really, 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 really light on my feet, happy, appreciative, and receptive, very feminine, you know? <laughs> I'm such a tomboy. It's kind of about time I step into my femininity. My full intent coming down here, my macro intent was to try to share with everybody in the world, for that matter, um, the fact that there's different ways to see reality and that we sort of in this moment of chaos need to take a step back, everybody, and you know, just try to see things a little differently. The only way that you're supposed to fulfill your role is by being yourself. That is the heightened you. You attract more love and you attract more energy. One of, the, one of my intents and one of the things I asked for was to face my fears. And I realized that, no, I don't need to face my fears. My fears are not gonna go away. First, I have to accept myself with my fears. Each person have a pattern. And that pattern is 50% woven by the person and 50% by the divine. Ayahuasca is capable of changing that whole pattern. From being one person one day, the next day you're completely another person. I'm open to light and love and just good vibes and anything that isn't on that vibration or frequency, I'm just like, I don't even see you, you don't exist. So that's how I'm walking into this ayahuasca trip. I'm just in a very receptive place. I just, you know, I know what I'm about, I know what I stand for and I know what I resonate with and, you know, I just, I just hope to walk that path and you know whoever's walking on, along that path you know I hope to meet you and we can join hands and you know take this trip together you know It happened for me in my ayahuasca experience when I was sitting there and I realized that I had just died as I was looking at death and experiencing death, I saw how dynamic it was and how much was going on. And I realized that I never needed to fear death again. It was totally liberating. And as I spent time in this ayahuasca experience, I realized that I was sitting in a place where I could ask any question. I could go into the future, I could go into the past, whatever I wanted to know. I'm gonna ask a big question. So I decided to ask, why do bad things happen? And immediately upon asking that, I was ripped out into the edge of space, back to where when you're a kid, you go, yeah, but what's past space? And people go, oh, more space. And what's past that? More space. I was out there on the edge, looking at everything in the universe basically contained, like God would look at it. And as I'm looking at it, Spirit said to me, you see that? It's totally balanced. It's perfect. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's true. It's totally balanced. It's perfect. If something happens over here, it'll just be made up over here. And as soon as I had that realization, I was sucked right back in. I was sitting in the room again. And as I was coming out, I just started to laugh. I was laughing and I realized that I had just gotten the entire human cosmic joke. Here we are with God, the man with the white beard and Buddha and Muhammad and Jesus, all these men. And I was with God and it was a woman. That has stuck with me every day since my ayahuasca experience. Well, for me, ingesting the medicine was uh, a destruction of everything I've ever known, everything I've ever believed in, everything I ever thought was true. I tried to reason it for a while, two days um, after. Try to reason the idea that it's a hallucinogenic drug, Michelle. It just, you know, it takes things from your subconscious and projects them. 
you know, there's absolutely no way that there's any truth in what you envisioned. Um, that it's, it's, it's just a trip. You know, you read tons of books on alchemy, you know, you have tons of, you know, information about symbolism and religion deep embedded into your brain since you're a little kid. But I know in my heart of hearts, it's not true. And that everything that I have ever known could quite probably be bullshit. <laughs> and uh, it makes me happy. I felt a peace and calm that I've never experienced in my life. An overwhelming feeling that I could relax instead of constantly macheting my way through life with my urban armor on. It just stripped everything away and put me in contact with something that was a benevolent higher power, as the only way I can really describe it. That's such a hard time. In the middle of it, I don't know. It's like a surgeon. And I felt my wounds, <coughs> my wounds just opened up. I was feeling the pain, and then uh, like I grew up, and I was able to uh, you know, love myself a little bit more. Once I got through that hard part, or the part that I needed to get out, it was just definitely the best life-changing experience that I've ever been through. When people access these medicines, they need to access with full love, with full willpower. Otherwise, they need to find other ways. People will transcend anyways. Now is the time. And these medicines are major assistants, major helpers, major masters you know, assisting this process of transition for humanity from one level of consciousness to a higher level of consciousness. I've lost a lot of anger, a lot of hatred, and a lot of, you know what, if you're an asshole, be an asshole. It's your fate. You know what I mean? Like, I'm easy now. Like, I'm not angry anymore at all the mean people in the world. You know? Because I accept that they're part of it. And it's all good, you know what I mean? It's not my walk. But, you know, do your thing and I respect your path, but don't come near me with your evil energy because I'll knock you the fuck out. <laughs> it all comes down to intent for me. If your intent is right, it's gonna work, it's gonna be better than you thought, and you're gonna have a lot less chaos. It seemed to me that nature recognizes that people are highly stressed, and that people need healing medicines for the problems of addiction and depression. I kept looking for ways to transcend on a daily basis, and I was introduced to Sri Sri Ravi Shankar and his breathing technique called Sudarshan Kriya. The technique is being done by millions of people, including prisoners and inner city youth who've been trained by Shri Shri to use the technique to overcome their physical environment and give themselves internal strength. Shri Shri's logic goes that when we're born, we draw in our first breath, and when we die, we let out our final breath. But most people think nothing of it in between, when in fact, Breathing may be our most valuable capability. Breath is an important tool, you know. For every emotion, there is a particular rhythm in the breath. And if we attend to the breath by manipulating your own breath, you can slip into uh, the altered state of consciousness at will. <laughs> I learned the Kriya breathing, which blew my mind. The 
The fact that I was able to put myself into a psychedelic state with just my breath. Lightning bolts were shooting out of my hands and feet. Time stood still. I continued to get together with my friends to talk about our experience and how we were integrating our psychonaut training into our lives. There's a whole group of scientists, very few but enough, who are saying maybe brain doesn't produce consciousness, maybe brain filters consciousness. You're saying we're transmitters? We're transmitters. <laughs> cool. And what you're transmitters <laughs> of is that infinite potential that you spoke of, that field of possibilities. And so when you start to break down the boundaries, then all that's left is the infinite. So the boundaries are like your prejudices, things yeah, that you concept, know that you've yeah. accumulated throughout life that you have either repel or are attracted to? Yeah, every boundary is a conceptual boundary in consciousness. This is an Earth rover. This gives me an opportunity to come to this planet, step into this suit, have these life experiences, be creative, and, 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 and marvel at this, the, that this planet that, that we come to. And it's so funny because A, I started this whole thing not spiritual. B, once I saw the nature of the cell membrane, the self receptors, I said, oh my God, instantaneously I had to recognize if you buy the science, then it's not, is there or is there not? There's a spirit. So it really helped me to bring my scientific mind and my kind of spiritual experience in together and realize they're not different at all. We're just discovering through all these pathways how all of that is one. After I started to really journey with the plants was when things sort of changed. When that older boyfriend of mine, I, I was like 24 at the time, and he told me I was an idiot. And he said, you need, you, you, you are very passionate, but you have nothing to, to back up how you feel about the world. You've got, you don't read, you don't have, you know, you read one book and you can get 20 years worth of research in one book. And he kind of like opened up my mind to do research and to fill my mind. Now when I see the world, I do a psychedelic, I think metaphorically, I think on so many different layers, I, you know, and of course I enjoy the moment too. I can chase sensations like any of them. You know, I love to feel good and have fun and interact with people, but you know, information is so beautiful. And if we could just tap into the reservoirs or fountains of, of the people before us, you know, you never know where it could take you. When I lost Paul, I was like, I went through uh, about a year of just being like an animal. Like, what could I do physically to just get my mind off of existentialism, get my mind off of how transient life is and how we just come here and could disappear at any moment. Um, how could I get my mind off of that? So I was just like, fuck, summer, crazy, nuts, <laughs> berserko. Like I did everything I could possibly do to hide from myself. And uh, I'll tell you that my ayahuasca trip made me sad that he left me here. <laughs> It wasn't a sadness that he's gone. It was more like a jealousy that he's there first. <laughs> That's fucked up, but yeah. <laughs> I think it was affirmed to me in the ayahuasca experience and some other trips I've had in my life where what was happening is when I took the medicine or I meditated, and I went inside that they, basically I was taking filters off is what was happening. So all this bullshit. Reticular I'm... activation system. It's like doors of perception when he popped it. Yeah. He felt like that filtration mechanism that we create by the age of seven mm -hmm. was just lifted off. You know how like you receive so much information in your, in your visual cortex, but your brain only accepts a certain amount mm -hmm. so that you're not overwhelmed. Right. That's your reticular activation system deciding according to your wants, likes, and, and, and fight or flight, mm -hmm. deciding what information you're gonna take in. 
Each time I got together with my fellow psychonauts, we felt stronger and stronger about the need to get the information out so we could help others to access some of these ancient techniques that had been so profound in our lives. We should just, you know, the Street Reality Society should set up a place in like Costa Rica. Put like a, a dome, haven for like people haven who of, think the same way? Put them all around the world. I and, like that. and the consciousness of it is like... I'm in. I'm in. All right. Everything's rolling along. Things are falling into place. And, you know, like everything in life, you, you want validation. You want to know that it's having some kind of an effect beyond just, hey, I'm having a good time. I'm learning a lot. I'm having all these cool experiences. But, you know, am I really, is something really happening? And I was looking for some kind of sign that, you know, it, it was making a difference because I couldn't see what the difference was and other than my own friends and people around me. So I, I was kind of thinking, God, give me a sign here that, you know, this is, is making a difference, that there's something to it. And then the phone call came from Jerry. Who I hadn't seen since we shot with Deepak in his apartment years earlier. Unbeknownst to me, Jerry had taken Deepak's advice as well. And he went down to Costa Rica to do a plant medicine called Iboga that comes from an African root. It's the strongest psychedelic known to man, and Jerry was taking it to see if he could break his addiction. The full moon came to Jerry and asked him if he wanted to see why he was so messed up. You know, because of my life, I had like addiction issues, tons of women issues, ego issues out the gazoo, smoking, drinking, you name it, I was a, f a fan, right? So uh, I said, what's, what's wrong with me? And so what happened then is that my body went to a house that I hadn't seen in 48 years. It was my, grand my grandfather's house in, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And at the front of the house, like three-year-old me is going like this to me. He's like waving me in. And I'm looking at the floor, and there was, as a kid, I knocked over uh, cranberry juice or grape juice, and it hit the wall, and that stain was on the wall. This is how perfect detail. And then next thing you know, the kid opened the door and like went like this to me, like, go look at it. And my grandfather was sexually molesting me, and I, I was three. The moon told Jerry to go see his dead grandfather, and have him explain why he'd done it and give him an apology. Jerry went to see his grandfather, who denied it ever happened, and sent him away. She told him to get his father to help him to get an apology from his grandfather. And he said that he was sorry, and I told him I forgave him, and uh, even though he wouldn't do anything for me. And then the guy, the shaman, goes, hey, go to the moon. So I went to the moon, back to the moon, and... Uh, I said, Mrs. Mrs. Moon, what can you do for me? And she said, open your chest. And I went like this, and my heart was in there. And the moon took my heart out and washed it. And she, I said, what, the shaman saying, what is she doing? I said, she's washing it like this, like, because she has hands, right? Crazy, but truth. She's washing it, and he said, I said, what should I do with it, you know, to the shaman? He said, have her put it in your left hand. I said, Mrs. Moon, would you put it in my left hand? And she put it in my left hand. And he goes, I said, what do you want me to do with it? He goes, put it in your chest. And I went to put it in my chest, and it got here, and it was black again. So it only stayed pink for like, I don't know, five seconds. And I said, I'm not putting this thing in me, because it's shit. You know, it's terrible. And, uh... He said, ask her for a new one. So I said, Mrs. Moon, could I please have a new heart? <laughs> you know, and she said, yeah. And then she gave me this new heart. And then I put it, I said, what do you want me to do with it? She said, put it in your left hand, put it in your chest. And then uh, the next day, I was a different guy. He hasn't touched drugs since, and he's able to have a drink socially without needing to get drunk. He's reunited with his family, and for the first time, He's in a real relationship. The first time I was invited to do plant medicine, I thought the person was crazy. I was like, you're gonna take 
a drug to get spiritual? I don't think so. And I wanted nothing to do with it. And it freaked me out. You know, my mom's a meth addict and I was a meditator. And uh, finally, this woman who's like just a, a love in my life invites me to go and I couldn't say no. So I went and that night um, she told me, set some intentions of, of what you want to see. And I said, okay, I want to see why I keep attracting the same psycho guy over and over and over with a different face sucking the light out of me. And the second thing that I wanted to see was, um, what was I here to do? And so that night was just one of the most amazing nights of my life. Um, I was shown exactly who I am, what I'm here to do, and exactly why I kept attracting that same psycho guy over and over and over again. <laughs> it's just amazing because Jerry and I wake up every day and we're just like, wow, is this our life? Like, we just feel so blessed to be in love with our best friend and to be doing what we love. Immediately when I came back and my kids saw me, they knew I was a different guy and they knew something changed. As soon as he walked through the door, I can like visibly see a difference, let alone when I was actually talking with him. I was like shocked, you know? I was like, well, I gotta give this thing a whirl. If it could, if it could turn him around 180, what could it do to me? The first time I saw Gerard after he did plant medicine, he didn't even have to speak or say one word to me. I could tell as I walked up to him about 15 feet away, I knew he was a changed person. The chances of someone coming out of that severe of a lifestyle case is very rare. I didn't want to drink anymore. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, went from that to nothing immediately. I can't even think about doing drugs. Like I can't even, I wouldn't even have the thought to go do some drugs. He's like zappy. Not only did I take plant medicine and break my addiction in one session, but I've actually opened up a center for people to come and expand their consciousness, heal themselves, break addiction, and it exists. And I was like, oh my God, it manifested from that conversation with Deepak that day where he said, stir it up in the pot and drink it. The moon told me, and this sounds so ridiculously crazy, but told me to go buy a center and to make it a, uh, a plant-based center. Told me what building to buy, told me what to pay for it, uh, told me how to treat my girlfriend, told me how to treat my children, uh, told me that, that everything would be okay. His place is called Rhythmia, and where is it? Should set up a place in like Costa Rica. This was the miracle I needed. This place had manifested out of that single conversation and the desire to help people break the wiring. The first ever clinic where people can go to expand their consciousness and heal themselves. While you're at Rhythmia, you can receive counseling and spiritual development, including a program developed specifically for Rhythmia by Reverend Michael Beckwith called The Answer Is You. It's a consciousness expanding program that allows people to one, take 100% responsibility for their own life, come out of the shame and blame game, blaming others. Two, it moves you through a period of of forgiving yourself and forgiving all others so as you can be clean inside. Three, you, you begin to embrace the vibration of intentionality, having an intention or a direction of how you want your life to be. You have to choose this. If we don't choose it, then the undertow of the human society is choosing for you. Going to a place like, you know, what's being created at Rhythmia's, a place where you can literally just come back to life's rhythm. You know, the miracle that you're going to get is that you're going to get the real truth. And the truth is that, that we are all, all of us, connected from the same thing. Uh, and that love is the thing that holds us all together. And when you get to that truth, that's, that's the whole thing that you've been running from your whole life, is that one truth. And then you come and you you come to a place like this and you get to see that that's the truth, then there's the miracle. And then you can walk away and go, you know what? You know, I lost everything this weekend or this week. 
but I gained my life. And what more could you ask for in a, in a vacation? <laughs> Everything I've gone through has truly been worth it. Because even before this movie's finished, it's already changed the world. Because this place exists. Every act that comes from purpose is supported by nature and has the potential to change things in ways you could have never dreamed of. How do I channel all of this connection into being an efficient human being in society? Into giving back? Because for me, love is everything. But you have to almost have a way to re-enter the ayahuasca experience almost on a daily basis to stay tapped into it. And that has to be through meditation or through something that would deliver you back there, if only for a moment. All of us had life-changing experiences. So the question is, how could these incredible plant energies be illegal today to consume or even to study? It turns out that the answer to that question may be even more sinister than the reason they've been taken out of religion, money. The pharmaceutical companies are only interested in selling their patented petroleum-based medications that people need to take for the rest of their lives. These drugs do not cure, but only mask the symptoms and have significant negative side effects. Here I am, living my entire life sustained by plants. I'm eating vegetarian, and my day job is bringing out a plant-based formula to help people with addiction. I owe everything to these ancient tools. Plant medicine, meditation, breathing. These are some of the tools that were once part of the religious tradition. It's time to bring them back. We started the True Reality Society to create a peace army to counteract mass violence in the world and to bring together people who believe in the importance of going inside their minds. When the sun comes up, I know I've lost it To the spirits that live beyond us But every time I sleep, I'm back Changing faces
Breathe in slowly and then breathe out slowly. On the in breath, perhaps having the thought peace. And on the out breath, the thought joy, peace. On the in breath and joy on the out breath.
and bring your awareness into your heart now and remember a great experience of love. Remember a great experience of compassion. A great experience of joy. A great experience of equanimity. The peace that passes understanding. And now bring your awareness back into your whole body and allow the boundaries of your body to slowly dissolve and merge with your surroundings. Recognize that every boundary is conceptual. There's no boundary. There are no national boundaries, there are no tribal boundaries, no ethnic boundaries, no racial boundaries, no religious boundaries. They're all imagination and they have limited our potential. We are the stars and we are the sky and we are the moon and we are the galaxies. We are the cosmic horizon, we are the Big Bang, we are the laws of nature, we are Planck scale space-time geometry where everything dissolves into all possibilities. Where platonic values like truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, evolution are embedded as the essential raw material of the universe. Where there is mathematical truth but also musical truth. Where there is the poetry of the universe and the dance of the universe. And we are that dance. The Sufi poet Rumi says, look at these worlds spinning out of nothingness. This is within your power. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. Out beyond all ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. So remember the field that you went to. It was beyond right doing and wrong doing. It was the field from where we come and which we long for. I'll let Roberto finish his Peruvian shamanic song.